So it's, it's, not, okay. it's not saying that it's recording, but it's recording. Okay, so welcome to Math 383 Complex Analysis. So this is lecture four. And what I want to do today is I want to talk about primitives and Grossat's theorem. And then if there's time, I will go back and I will review Green's theorem and some of the results from analysis. So this class has to move at a fast pace. This is a graduate course, and I need to assume that you have mastered the material in the previous courses. If you have trouble with that, that's why we have TAs with office hours. That's why I am available as well. And so if you are confused about any of the stuff from real analysis, just let me know and we can arrange a time to chat. All right. One of the things you will learn, uh, it's having me now adjust where this thing is. One of the things you will learn in complex analysis is we like to take concepts that you've learned and used for years and give them a different name. We've already talked about what word we use for function to be differentiable. So what is our word for differentiable? Holomorphic. And so if I want the opposite of differentiation, what would you call that? Integration, you could also call it what else? It's a hyphenated phrase. Anti-derivative, but that sounds so negative to be saying it's the anti-derivative. So we often say integral, you could say anti-derivative. We're now gonna talk about a primitive. So a primitive, for a function f on an open set omega is a function big F that is holomorphic and the derivative of big F is little f. Do we really need to use the word primitive? Yes. Yeah, this way you can sound highfalutin when you're talking to the other people who aren't taking complex analysis. Okay, so when we say primitive, we're really just talking about an antiderivative. Okay, not a big deal. So the big result today is Grossas theorem. If omega is an open set in C and T is some triangle whose interior is contained. And the reason we want stuff like this is differentiability is a local concept. I wanna talk about a point. I wanna draw a small ball about that point and study what's going on in that neighborhood. In the real line, it's an interval for complex analysis. It's going to be a small ball. To be safe, I'm going to assume my function is differentiable not just inside the triangle and on the triangle, but in a slightly larger space that includes the triangle. So that any point on the boundary, I can draw a small ball and still have everything be differentiable. And so what this is saying is that um, if I take any triangle where um, F is holomorphic, then the integral of F along uh, the triangle is equal to zero. The triangle is a very nice shape. And so we're going to do a lot of our analysis based on triangles because triangles connect nicely. What other shape could you could potentially use? Squares. No, <laughs> not a square. You can weaken square a little bit and I'll accept it. Yes. Well, no, 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 that's we can get too much. You know, how do you weaken the square just a little bit? Rectangles, right? You know, a square is a very special, but you know, the union of two squares is not going to be a square, but it could be a rectangle. So you could try to develop the theory for rectangles. If you can do things for squares, I'm sorry, can you do things for triangles? If you can do things for triangles, can you do things for squares? So imagine you knew the integral over any triangle was zero. Could you get the integral over a rectangle? How? Yes. Should we change variables to dilate the plane a bit? Nope, 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 way too hard. Two triangles. Yeah, two triangles make a rectangle. So if I draw a big fat rectangle like this, if I just draw it like this, now I've got two triangles. And so if I know things for triangles, I immediately know things for rectangles. So going from a triangle to a rectangle is easy. The other direction, going from if you know things are true for rectangles, do you know things for triangles? That's not as clear. So if I want to try to go in that direction, it's much harder. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to talk about, uh, yes. Are we integrating over the region inside the triangle? Or the no, we're integrating all along the boundary. No, why don't we just make it like, oh. It's not a closed curve. It is a closed curve. So we're, what we're doing, we have some triangle 
maybe like this. And then we have some open set omega that contains the triangle. But don't we assume that the curve is smooth? But triangle is not smooth. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying the curve is smooth here. I'm just saying if I integrate over the triangle, then I get zero. And then the whole point is we want to try to generalize this. We want to say, rather than integrating over a triangle, what if we just integrated over a nice curve? Would we, um, in a case like that, would we have the same result? Or is it essential that we're doing things over uh, something like a triangle? Because, yes. So is the triangle the curve, or is it like the, the surface including the curve? The, the triangle is the curve. We're integrating on the boundary of the triangle. Sometimes we'll use um, like the partial derivative symbol to denote boundary. And so uh, is if I have some curve, say, you know, gamma of t, what that means is I have some interval of zero, one maybe, and I have some map into space. And you know, here's my curve, you know, gamma of t. And maybe I take this point over here and that comes to the point over there. So I'm parametrizing my curve. And since it's a closed curve, you know, this would be maybe gamma of zero equals gamma of one. I'm coming back to where I started. Okay, so this is a closed curve. And so when you, do integrals in multivariable calculus. I'm trying to avoid you know, as much multivariable calculus as I can. You know, if I want to integrate along a closed curve of you know, f, what this really means is I'm integrating f of gamma of t, gamma prime of t dt. And maybe t goes from zero to one. Yeah. This is what I mean by integrating a function along a curve. And then you have a lot of things that you want to prove. What if I parametrize my curve in a different way? Will I get the same answer? What if I go backwards? Well, if I go backwards, I should be getting the negative answer. But what if I go through the curve twice as fast? And you, know, you want to see how well-defined all of this is. And so imagine that big F prime equals little f. So f has a primitive, f has a nice integral. I've got f of gamma of t, gamma prime of t. Does this look like anything nice to you? Yes. Sort of like chain rule. Yeah, it's like the chain rule. So it's the derivative of big F of gamma of t. So I want to integrate the derivative. I must be in a good mood to give you a problem like this, right? What's the integral of the derivative? Just whatever I have. So this is just going to equal f of gamma of t at 0 and 1. So it's going to be big F gamma of 1 minus big F gamma of 0 equals 0 as gamma of 1 equals gamma of 0. So if I have a nice function that has a primitive, that has an antiderivative, and I want to integrate that along a closed curve, I'm just going to get 0. In one dimension, how many closed curves can you give me? I think we might have talked about this. It's just a point, right? Closed curves are boring in one dimension, right? You know, right now, I'm actually exploring a really interesting closed curve. You know, I'll go around one of my students. You know, maybe I'll even go around one of my students twice, right? And then as long as I keep going like this, and I come back to where I started, this is a closed curve. This is a very interesting closed curve. I've gone around a student. I've gone around a chair, a desk, and a table. You have a lot more interesting geometry in higher dimensions. We will see um, at the end of the semester when we look at complex analysis in several variables, the geometry gets fascinating again. 
But right now, there's a lot that happens going up from one dimension to two dimensions or one complex dimension. So we now have the opportunity of having some interesting closed curves. So the first thing is, if I have a function that has a primitive, the analysis we just gave you over here is still going to work and show that the integral is zero. So when we're looking at Grossat's theorem, if instead of saying that f is holomorphic, if I just said f had a primitive, then the result would be true. And the result would be true by the chain rule and how we're defining things. So if I can prove that my function has a primitive, then I'm done. But maybe not every holomorphic function has a primitive. So it could be possible that my function is differentiable, but maybe it doesn't have an antiderivative. Or if there is an antiderivative, maybe it's a lot of work to prove it. And so there could be a result that's true, but the result might be a lot of work. Uh, how many of you have seen a proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus? So if you assume that you're looking on a bounded interval, which without loss of generality, of course is zero one, right? We can use equicontinuity. If the function is equicontinuous, we can use that to show the upper sums converge to the lower sums, but you need to know a little bit of analysis. If I make the additional assumption that my function is differentiable and has bounded first derivative, the proof becomes a lot easier. I don't have to appeal to results from analysis. So these are things that you want to really ponder as to how much do we want to assume. If I assume that my function has a primitive, then the result is trivial. It's the argument I just gave you a moment ago. So one way to try to prove Gossard's theorem is to show that if you're holomorphic, there's a primitive. Or to show that if there's not a primitive, there's maybe something that's so close to a primitive that maybe I can deal with the other piece. So let's try to find functions that have primitives. So search for primitives. Because if there are no primitives, then we're really up the creek. So can somebody give me a function f, little f, that has a primitive? So this might be something out of bed, but I think the analytic function will have primitives, which are just like the u cubed backwards. Right, but then you have to show that that's. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know if it's good proof, but I'm just guessing. Right. But you have an infinite sum. Yeah, I know. I know. Yes. Yeah. And so this is the problem. This is why I hate the beginning of every complex analysis class, because in the beginning, we haven't proven anything. So you have to be very careful. Okay, but polynomials. Polynomials. So if I give you z to the n, its primitive is just going to be z to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Any restrictions? N is not equal to negative 1. 1 over z, does that have a primitive? Yep. Right. So right now, we do not know a function that has derivative 1 over z. We have a guess. Right? What would be your guess? Log of z. But it turns out the logarithm is an extremely complicated function to work with as a function of a complex variable. We're going to spend a lot of time trying to understand this. We can do any finite polynomial. You know, the sum, uh, let's say, n goes from 0 to big N, you know, a n, z to the n. That'll just go to you know, the sum, n goes from 0 to n of a n, z to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. So polynomials will be fine. And then it turns out that uh, if I give you, say, the sum of you know, a n, z to the n, n goes from 0 to infinity, it does have a primitive, n goes from 0 to infinity, uh, a n, z to the n over n plus 1, if z is less than r, where the original f converges absolutely for z less than r. So if you have a series that converges, you know, absolutely inside some interval or some region, 
then you can integrate term by term. You can differentiate term by term. How many of you have ever seen a three epsilon proof in a real analysis class? You break things up into three parts. You start each part is less than epsilon. The sum is less than three epsilon. If you want to be fancy, you prove each part is less than epsilon over three. And then at the end of the day, you get epsilon. But the idea is you break things up into your various parts. The lecture that I had you watch goes through, I believe, a three epsilon proof. The book goes through that as well. You can prove that you can differentiate term by term. You can prove that you can integrate term by term within the radius of convergence. This goes back to sequences and series going all the way back maybe to multivariable or to BC calculus. Uh, one way we calculate the radius of convergence is we look at the limit of the nth root of the absolute value of a n. And if I take the derivatives, I'd be multiplying the terms by n. That's not going to change the limit of the nth root because the nth root of n converges to 1. So you can show that you can differentiate term by term within the radius of convergence. Integrating term by term is even easier because this is just making things small. So things converged absolutely before, they're going to converge absolutely now. So we actually have a bunch of functions that um, have primitives. And so if I give you any function of a series expansion that converges, I can integrate term by term and I can get a primitive. Okay, so what we want to do now, um, I'm gonna skip the e to the z for now. Um, and so we've got our candidates. And so let's try to prove Gossard's theorem. But I wanna to try to prove the time for All right. And so again, so much of this is trying to figure out what is going to piece together nicely. So I start off with a triangle. It's one of the few shapes I can somewhat draw. Okay, so here's my triangle T. Let's call this angle alpha. Let's call this angle, I'm gonna use the same notes as what I had before. I'm gonna use beta over here. I'll use gamma over here. So we'll call this A, B, and C. And then what I'm going to do is I will take the midpoints of these sides. And I will divide my triangle into four smaller triangles. What can you tell me about these four smaller triangles? They're all congruent. So do we agree that the small triangle here will each side is half the length of the side of the big triangle. So we've got side, angle, side. Does side, angle, side work? Yes. So since side, angle, side works, we know that this has to be beta and this has to be gamma over here. Similarly, this has to be alpha and this has to be gamma over here. So three of the four triangles, it's very easy to prove that they're similar. For the fourth one, if you look down below, what do we know the angle has to be between alpha and beta? Gamma, why? Good, the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180. I know alpha plus beta plus gamma is 180. I really shouldn't say 180 in a graduate level class. What should I be saying? Pi. Anyways, so over here now, oh, I didn't write it for the top one. Um, we know that this has to be alpha over here, this has to be beta over here. And then by doing a similar argument, this would have to be alpha over here, and this would have to be beta over here. Is angle, angle, angle valid for similar? Yeah, angle, angle, angle is okay. Which was the one that's not okay? Side, side, angle. It's better to say it another way. ASS, A -S -S, right? So if I give you you don't want to make an ass of yourself, but if I give you, say, let's see, um, side, ang we're, doing, uh, we're doing angle, side, side? Okay, yes. So let's say I give you some angle over here. I give you a side length here, and then I give you another side length. That side 
can actually hit this in two different places, right? What you can do is you can look at you know, a circle centered at this point, and there will be two possible triangles you can construct in general. You might be very lucky based on the side length, there might be only one place that's gonna hit that. But in general, you'll have two possibilities. And so angle side side is not valid. Everything else we've been doing is perfectly fine. So if I take a triangle, I can break it into four smaller similar triangles. And then what can I do to each of those four smaller similar triangles? Keep doing. So how many of you have ever read the instructions on shampoo? Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, I mean, may maybe your parents or an older sibling gave you the shampoo lecture at some point when you were growing up in terms of how you should use shampoo. What are the instructions on shampoo? Oh, is it rinse? Oh, I always thought it was lather, rinse, repeat. Oh, yeah, I have non-lather shampoo. You have non-lather shampoo. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what is the best movie where Hia Kia shampooing plays a key role? Cultural yeah. reference. Involves a perm. Legally Blonde, excellent. Yes, no. yes. <laughs> so I often refer to this as shampoo mathematics. You keep doing the same thing again and again and again. We keep subdividing the triangles. Well, this initial level T0. And then we have four smaller triangles. And those four triangles will be level one, then level two, then level three. Now, I claim that the integral over T0 of f is equal to the integral over, let's call it T11f plus the integral over T12 of f plus the integral over T13 of f plus the integral over T14 of f. And the reason is when I integrate, whenever I have an internal side in the, in the blue triangle, I'm gonna traverse it twice, once in each direction. And so when I do my integration, um, we need more colors, that's not a problem. You know, I'll come down like this, and I'll come down here, but then this one, you know, I'll get, and they will all be canceling. So all the internal integrals cancel. And so if I integrate over the four triangles, the integral over the four triangles is the same as the integral over the big triangle. We're all happy with this. Would you be happy if I put an absolute value over both sides? Sure. Now, what's true about the absolute value of a sum? Less than equal to the sum of the absolute values, right? So I know that um, the integral, so, oh crap, it somehow moved into. So the integral over T zero of F is less than equal to the maximum uh, one less than equal to J less than equal to four of the integral over T one J of F. Why am I using J for my subscript? We don't use J as our subscript as our first choice. I is, just I is, complex. I is complex analysis, right? Do not use I as a subscript. You know, it's a recipe for disaster. Think about the notation you're using, okay? So we know it must be less than equal to the maximum of that, right? If I can show that this is zero, what must be true about this? Zero. Uh, there is one small mistake, though. It's not less than equal to maximum of this. Um, well, I don't want to do the sum. Four times. four times. It's less than equal to four times. Okay. And call the J. Well, let's, let's call the associated triangle to the max j to be triangle T1. 
So for instance, maybe this is now our triangle T1. And then we subdivide T1 and there'll be four triangles there. And whichever one is the maximum, we call that T2. Okay, is everybody comfortable with this? At each point in time, we just keep using the triangle inequality. And so the absolute value of the sum is less equal to the sum of the absolute values. There's four of them. Whichever one is the biggest. Is there a unique biggest? Is there always a unique biggest? Not necessarily. Do we care? No. Just choose any one and keep going. So if we do this a lot of times, we eventually get that the integral over t of f is less than equal to 4 to the n of the integral over t, we'll call it t sub n, so was, I guess, t sub 0 of f. OK, and we've just divided it and divided it and divided it. OK. What can you tell me about the size of this triangle? Yes. Since the diameter converges to 0 and it's compact, it yes. be a single point. Well, it's never going to be a single point. Really? Really? For any finite n, it's not going to be a single point, right? Do you agree that for any finite n, it's not a single point? No. No? Yes. So if, if, I, if I only do it, if I do it a billion times, it's still going to be a very small triangle. Oh, oh for infinite. Right, but unfortunately, we're multiplying by 4 to the n. So I agree that it converges to a single point, but it's being multiplied by plus infinity. Um, I think that for like a holomorphic like bounded function, right? It it'll will be like essentially integrating along this triangle with like an approximate or like an approximately constant function. Yes. It will be like so, like I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I think it'll, be it'll be mostly primitive. Yeah. So it's almost a point. And the whole idea is by doing this enough times, we're so localized that how bad it is is not so bad. So let's draw the triangle not to scale. Okay, so we've got you know, our triangle now like this. And this is very small. Okay. So there's some point inside the triangle, we can call that Z naught. And you know, we can look at what f is near that point. Okay, how big is the are the sides relative to the sides of the original triangle? I'm sorry, not one fourth. Not one fourth to the end. One over two to the end. Because right, we have four triangles, so it's four to the end. Each side is. Every time we iterate, it's one half the previous. So we do it n times, so it's one over two to the n. So right now you might be a little bit afraid because one over two to the n is getting small, but one over four to the n is getting large and it's getting much faster. So we need an extra one over two to the n coming from somewhere or we're in trouble. Now, at some point, we should probably use the assumption about the function, right? What did we assume about the function? Holomorphic. So as f is holomorphic, we know that the limit as z goes to z naught of f of z minus f of z naught over z minus z naught equals zero. So let's let um, e z naught of z be um, f of z minus f of z naught. Oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't equal zero. What does it equal? Prime. F prime at z naught. So let's let e of z naught be equal to f of z minus f of z naught over z minus z naught. Um, Plus f prime of z naught. That's a little bit hard to read. So just... Plus f prime of z naught. 
So this limit, I can really view this as f of z minus f of z naught over z minus z naught equals, um, oh no, sorry. I, I want to do this, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll do it this way. I want to do it this way. I'll do it as f of z naught prime minus this. So then this is going to equal f prime of z naught plus the error. Okay. Let's see, have I done this correctly now? Oh. Am, I, am I subtracting in the wrong order? No, I did, I did, I did have it right. Uh, I keep flipping where the minus sign is. I want it this way. Minus of prime of z naught. No. Uh, okay. So what happens as z gets closer and closer to z naught? The error gets smaller, right? So do we all agree that as z goes to z naught, the error goes to z naught? So as z goes to z naught, the error goes to zero. Do we know how fast it goes to zero? Do we have any control over how quickly it just goes to zero? So we get from this that f of z is equal to, uh, when you multiply everything out, f of z naught plus f prime of z naught, z minus z naught plus the error at z naught of z times z minus z naught. I've just multiplied both sides by z minus z naught. I'm gonna just write this on the next page so it's a bit easy to see. Is everybody comfortable that I've just multiplied through by z minus z naught? All right, let's try to find primitive. Can somebody give me a primitive of f of z naught? I'm sorry? Nope. Z times. z times. Right. It's just f of z naught times z. I want a function whose derivative is f of z naught. f of z naught is just, right? So what, what point do you think z naught is? That's probably going to be the limit of what all these triangles are converging down to. So this is its primitive. So we found a primitive for f of z naught. What about f prime of z naught times z minus z naught? Can you give me a function whose derivative is f prime of z naught times z minus z naught? One over two. Two, like, whatever two z prime of z naught. Well, what, what function has derivative z minus z naught? Uh, z z square minus squared. And then you're making it to at z minus z naught squared. And you might want to put the two if you want over here. It doesn't really matter. But sometimes just visually, you know, what's going to have derivative z minus z naught? z minus z naught squared over two. So this also has a primitive. Does this have a primitive? I don't know. You know we would need to know a lot more about what this function e of z naught is. But we at least know that the first two pieces have primitives. So now 
if we integrate f over tn, this is equal to the integral of f of z, z over tn, plus the integral over tn of f prime of z naught, z minus z naught squared over two, plus the integral over tn of epsilon of, of e z naught of z, z minus z naught. What is this first integral equal to? Zero. What's the second integral equal to? Zero. So we now know that the absolute value of the integral over tn of f is equal to the, inter the absolute value of the integral over you know, tn of e z naught of z, z minus z naught dz. Questions? Oh, sorry, this, this should be f of z naught. Sorry, that should be f of z naught. Well, we're, just, we're just integrating along a nice closed curve. This is what we did at the start of the lecture, where if we just integrate over the closed curve, if we have an antiderivative, if we have a primitive, then we get the primitive at the two endpoints. But since the two endpoints are the same, it's going to just be zero. So we really, when we're trying to prove Gossard's theorem, if I assume instead of holomorphic, if I assume f has a primitive, we know that this is trivially true just by using the chain rules. Whenever we have a function that has a primitive, we know the integral is going to be zero. So the difficulty is, what if we don't have a primitive? What if we just have that um, the function is differentiable? Well, we've said that, well, if the function is differentiable, then there's a small error which tends to zero. And we can write f of z as f at z naught plus f prime at z naught, z minus z naught, plus that small error times z minus z naught. And what's going to save us here is we have two things that are small. The error is small, and z minus z naught is small. So now we just have to integrate our function over this triangle. And so this is going to be less than or equal to the maximum value of e z naught of z, right? How large can z minus z naught be? So we'll do it slowly. Times the maximum of z minus z naught, where z is in the triangle. And then we have times the perimeter of tn. Right? So just take your triangle. We know it's perimeter. And multiply by the largest thing you can. What's the largest that can be? And assume all the signs reinforced. Assume things go as bad as possible for you. OK. So how large can the perimeter be? Yes. Are we assuming, like, so z is on the perimeter? Z is on the perimeter. Inside. It's not inside. Where is z not? So here is our triangle. Oops. Here is z naught on the inside. And then z is going to be you know, going along the boundary. How far can z be from z naught? Yes. Maybe like at most half of the larger side length would be like a down. OK. That's different than. Yep. 1 over 2 to the n. 1 over 2 to the n times what? And maybe one, one sure, we, I, I don't mind overestimating by a little bit. If you're trying to show something goes to zero, if you show one fifth of it goes to zero, that's great. If you show five times it goes to zero, that's great. So this is going to be less than equal to the maximum of the error of z. And then the maximum of z minus z naught, that's going to be clearly at most 
you know, the perimeter of Tn. You know, the can't, you can't be further from Z naught than you can be from you know, the two vertices that are furthest apart. Overestimate. Oh, good, that's perimeter squared. How can you relate the perimeter of Tn to the perimeter of the original triangle? One over two to the n. So, and now we know this goes to zero. So this is less equal to the maximum of E z naught of z times one over four to the n, the perimeter of the original triangle. Ah, we had a four to the n explosion from before. You know, we had four times that. And so you know, the more times we do this, every time we subdivide, we get another factor four. We do it twice, we have four squared, three times four cubed. So we do it n times, we get a four to the n. We were a little bit worried about that, but we have a one over four to the n, which is gonna perfectly balance. And so when we put that all in, we now get that the integral over t of f is less equal to four to the n times the maximum of e z naught of z. And this is going to be z on the nth triangle times one over four to the n, the primitive t. But the primitive t is fixed. Question? Oh, sorry, it's perimeter is great here. Yes, thank you. Um, yes. Which is constant. So what's nice is this is going to be less than equal to some constant times the maximum of z in Tn of E z naught of z. And what does that go to? Yes. So we have a primitive t from here right. and a primitive t from the maximum of z minus z naught. How far can z minus z naught be? Right. Okay. So this is uh, use z minus z naught is less equal to the perimeter of Tn. And again, it is possible if z naught happened to be right down there and z happened to be right over there, well, perimeter t is overestimating. I think you can do better than perimeter of t. It doesn't matter. It's not worth doing. And so this has to go to zero and that finishes the proof. Geometrically, what is the maximum? Well, it's just the, the maximum value of this function. You know, we're, we're looking at, we assumed our function was differentiable. And so since we assumed it's differentiable, we can write this quotient as f prime of z naught plus something that goes to zero. And we don't need to know anything about the rate at which it goes to zero. This is a really good idea to extract from problems like this. Don't make yourself miserable trying to get the best bounds possible. Just get a good enough bound for what you're trying to do. For what we're trying to do, all I need is something that goes to zero. Uh, some of you have probably seen this. This is one of my favorite problems I've ever seen. Let's call this an aside. Take the digits one, two through nine and form three three digit numbers. Use each once and only once. You can make the sum equal one. There's a way to do this so that the sum will equal one. So maybe it's one over 23 plus four over 50. No. So as a nice exercise, how do you do this? So I first heard this problem when I was at a math institute surrounded by some of the top number theorists in the world. And they started proving theorems about where the five could or could not be or the nine could or could not be. 
How many possibilities are there to check? How many? Quantified many. Nine factorial. Anybody know roughly how big nine factorial is? I think it's like around 330,000. You can all do 330,000 cases in your head, right? Computer can. So I claim that you can, without loss of generality, assume something about the location of the nine. What can you assume about the location of the nine without loss of generality? First term. First term. Just reorder, addition is commutative. Without loss of generality, the nine is one of the first three numbers. You can actually show that the nine can't be the top. It's going to get, I think, too large. You know, if you have, if so, looking at it, it doesn't matter. Without loss of generality, nine has to be one of the first three numbers. I realized it would take me longer to code the three cases than to have the computer just run through all 330 possible 330,000 possible cases. There was no point in making the code efficient because I was only running it once. I'm not going to get an extra star or pat on the back. I'm going to spend more time coding that knowledge than just writing the fast code and having it run once. It's the same philosophy in what we were doing over here. I'm not trying to get the best bound that goes to zero. I just need to prove that in the limit, it goes to zero. So I can absolutely bound how large can Z minus Z not be just by looking at, hey, it's at most the perimeter of the triangle. You know, it's really at most the largest side, but there's no need to be clever. You're not saving anything. All right. Um, so one last thing, and then this will probably be a good place to start. So if I give you, say, a curve like this, you know, what we're seeing here is we can understand things very nicely with triangles. With triangles, we can get squares and rectangles. So maybe what we can do is we can replace general curves with polygonal paths. And so does everyone agree I can come up with a polygonal path approximating the given curve, you know, as well as I want. Yes. And so the idea is rather, yes. Well, it depends on what you mean by approximating. No, but it, but if I wanted to have um, basically be the same object in space, I can be within epsilon point wise any small epsilon you want. And so what we would get is, you know, the length of the curve in blue is the same as the length of the red approximation, right? Because point-wise, they're all close. Yes? Do we agree or do we not agree? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going up and down, up and down. But it's close at every, at every point. Yes. So like if we take like the arc length of a circle. Yes. And like technically using that logic, we can yes. say like, well, like the, the, the arc length of like quarter of a circle equals to two. Yes. Right. Yes. That's not true. Uh, I think like if you do this and then you simultaneously limit like the corners to be getting closer, that so that it's also getting like arbitrarily smooth kind of. Right. Then the arc length will also. The, the, but I'm not, I'm not doing anything smooth. I'm just doing a polygonal path. No, I know it's not smooth, but it's like you're like the, the, the angles are getting between the things in the polygonal curve. Right. Like yeah, yeah. So if I chose, if I did polygonal lines on the curve, that'd be different. Yes. Um, well, I noticed, so it's in the polygonal curve, it's always moving down instead. Yes. So in total, you're going to move. Good. Down. Good. So drop everything down and you get this and drop all the ones to the left and you get this. And this is basically telling you any two curves have the same length. They have the same start and stop and they just go monotonically down. This is bullshit. It's a technical term. It's like holomorphic and primitive. Okay. It's a new term for complex analysis, which you've never heard before. Right? No. 
Not all curves have the same length that they have the same two points. You've got to be extremely careful when you do calculations like this. I'm close at every single point. What's really going on is ds does not equal dx plus dy. ds is equal to the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. This is why when you do calculus, it's not so bad to find volumes of regions, but to find lengths of curves is very hard. We have to really work to give you curves where you can calculate the length nicely because you've got that square root. But if we are squaring things, if we're doing your know, surface area, things become much nicer. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Have a great weekend.